Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to MOS Live, our live animal show about invasive species today. My name is Karen. I'm one of the many educators at the Museum of Science. I'm so excited uh, to be here with you virtually today. And I will be acting as your moderator. So that just means I'll be keeping an eye out on the Q&A box, looking for any of your comments, your observations, or your questions. And in just a minute, we will get to meet our live Animal Center staff and some of their live creatures that they're sharing with us today. But if you are watching here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A box to put in any of those observations or questions. If you are watching on Facebook or YouTube Live, unfortunately, we cannot see comments and questions from there. And lastly, if you do need closed captioning, you can click on the CC button and choose show subtitles. So with all that out of the way, I think it's time to meet our live animal care center staff. Hello everyone. So my name is Corey. I'm the invertebrate keeper here at the museum and doing the other half of the show today will be Liz who is our assistant curator in our live animal center. So for those of you guys who tune in regularly to our program, you may be looking behind me and notice we are in a completely different space. So we are actually up in our insect zoo to show you guys one of our really cool animals here. So I'm gonna have Liz turn on our animal cam. And we are looking into our leaf cutter exhibit right now. So all of those tiny little dots uh, crawling around on the leaf are on our leaves and on our flowers are leaf cutter ants. So leaf cutter ants, there's about 47 species that fall under that common name. Um, we kind of refer to them generally, because they all kind of do the same thing. They cut leaves that then they take back to their home to feed to their fungus, which we're going to talk about more in a little bit. So this species of leafcutter ants lives in uh, South America and Central America, mainly in Costa Rica. So a little history about our leafcutter ants. In this group, we have thousands and thousands of ants. And each ant has its own job and that depends on the size of the ant. So there are four different types of ants within the colony and each one of them has a very specific job that they do. So as you can see, one of our uh, ants jobs right here is to carry the leaves that are cut back over to its fungus chamber. So Liz right now is gonna be showing you our journey of our leaf cutter ants who go through these tubes to get back to their fungus chamber. Once they get to their fungus chamber, they break down the leaf and they feed it to their fungus. So they're actually gardeners. They propagate the fungus and the fungus makes their food. And that's how what the ants eat. And they've co-evolved for so long together that the ants cannot live without the fungus and the fungus can't live without the ants. So it's a really, really special relationship that these guys have evolved to have. What makes leaf cutter ants so, so cool is that they have one queen and they will only ever follow that one queen. So other ant species, and, and we think of bees too when we think of queens, they tend to be able to accept a new queen or have multiple queens. Um, leafcutter ants, they will only ever have one. And that queen can live anywhere from 15 to 20 years, which is really long. Workers live about three to seven months so once a queen dies, the whole colony will collapse. They will not accept a new queen. So to kind of circle back to our topic today, which is invasive species, uh, leafcutter ants. Ants in general are pretty good at being invasive species. Um, they're able to get a foothold in, especially you know, in the United States, we see lots of ants that can be moved from state to state and they can cause really big problems from um, taking down foliage to eating, um, to eating food that other animals eat. Um, but we really see this with insects a lot because it's something that we don't think about. These tiny little animals that can just cause so much destruction to our native habitats. So Liz is gonna give you guys a look on the inside of our fungus chamber right now. So this is really cool. Um, when you come to the museum, you don't actually get to see inside. So you can see all of them kind of working on their inside, moving those boxes all have the fungus in them and they will carry those leaves up to feed it to the fungus. So as I, as I was saying with our invasive species, uh, leafcutter ants have started to invade into the United States. A lot of that has to do with um, 
climate change, but then also it's why we have to be so careful about bringing in plants. So things that we don't even think about. Um, if you buy plants from Florida, they have to go through a special, um, they have to go through a special system that gets rid of fire ants because those can really come in and really devastate um, an ecosystem. So I'm actually gonna turn it over and see if we have any questions about ants. And if not, we'll just keep going. Yeah, we don't have any questions, but I guess I have sort of a clarifying question. When we say yeah. invasive species, what exactly are we talking about? What, why is that a bad thing, a good thing? That is such a great question. I'm so glad you asked that, Karen. So an invasive species is an animal that has been, an animal or plant that has been transplanted into an ecosystem or an environment that it's not naturally from. And usually what happens is then that animal doesn't usually have any natural predators. So there's no checks and balances in the system. So that animal ends up taking over. A really great example of this is, uh, it ha this has happened in Florida. There was a butterfly uh, called a propona that was in a butterfly house. And this was back when, you know, we weren't, we weren't as careful um, with containment and letting animals out into the, into the wild. And this butterfly escaped the butterfly house and now has a natural population in Florida. And you might think, that's not a bad, I, that's not a bad thing. A propona is a really cool, beautiful blue butterfly. It sounds pretty awesome. But this butterfly, the caterpillars have actually decimated um, a native species that another butterfly in Florida really relies on and they need that plant. So now that species is starting to go extinct. So that's why it's really important that we, um, we look at these species that are brought in and invasive species and try to control them. Another one that you may recognize is the, um, oh my gosh, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, the Japanese beetle, which is very, we have a ton of here. It's really, if you go out anywhere in Massachusetts, you're more likely to see a Japanese beetle, which is a non-native beetle, than you are to see a native beetle. They're everywhere. Um, so it's really important that we, you know, are very careful about what we introduce into our environment. We do have animals that are not native, but then they do get a foothold in and they do, um, they are able to survive in the, in the ecosystem and they kind of become naturalized. So one of these, a really great example is a, um, a Chinese praying mantis. Uh, Chinese praying mantis are not native to the United States but they um, now live uh, almost across the whole eastern uh, side of the country. Um, there's a lot of them, they're doing really well, but they do have a check. There are other animals that eat them, so they're not out of control. They're also carnivores, and in the United States, we're not as worried about carnivore and carnivorous animals as we are with plant animals, and that big reason is because if we are bringing in animals that can affect plants, those could affect our crops and could affect our food. So especially when you come up here to the butterfly garden, you'll see a lot of insects that are not native to our area and or um, our insect zoo. And when you come to the insect zoo, all of these animals cannot leave the insect zoo. And that is because if they got out into the wild, it could really um, demolish our ecosystem. Excellent. Thank you. And I gave time for a couple of questions to come in. So maybe as Liz is sort of transitioning from the leaf cutter ants back uh, to help the next living creature. So Cedric, who is eight, wants to know what are the names of the smaller ants? And Carlos, who is nine, asks how big is the queen? Great question. So there are the four types of ants that I mentioned are uh, minims, ma uh, minors, medins, and majors. So the middens are the smallest ant and they actually, um, they tend to protect the leaves as they're carrying them. They organize, they take care of the, of the, the baby ants, the eggs and the, and the larva um, over in the nest. So each one has their own job. The ones that are bigger are soldier ants. So those guys protect the colony. And if there's, you know, any intruder trying to get in and they have a pretty, nasty bite. So when they bite, not only does it hurt, but they leave a little bit of um, acid behind as well. So it does sting afterwards. The queen 
she is probably about the size of my thumb. So very large. So when you see the queen, you know. To me, she doesn't even really look like a like the rest of the leaf cutter ant. She looks very different. Um, we don't, I don't ever go look for our queen. It'd be a really bad sign if I saw our queen. Um, that would mean something's wrong because she is tucked away being protected, laying eggs and keeping the colony going. So, so very awesome. And let me know um, if Liz is ready. Oh, cause somebody asked, is there a boy king? Anthony that, asked that. That is a great question. So there, um, there are male ants, but they're very rare and they're really only used for mating. Um, so it's a wonderful question, but pretty much in general, they're all females. So I'm actually gonna go put my mask on and Liz is gonna switch with me and we are gonna pull out our next animal. Excellent. So I will try to answer this one as Liz and Corey are swapping. Um, Egan, who is 10 and a quarter, asked, what is the stuff fungus gives out? Um, the ants are eating the fungus. So they're feeding the leaves to the fungus. The fungus is then growing. And the ants themselves, I believe, are then feeding it to their young. So hopefully I did not misspeak. Um, and if I did, I'm sure Liz will tell me. No, that sounded good. Awesome. Um, I think we're about ready for our next invasive species. Now this one, I'll give you a hint, is an amphibian. Oh, and he is in a, <laughs> an awesome pose right now. So this is an animal called a cane toad, also known as a giant toad, also known as a marine toad. Now they're actually the largest species of toad. Uh, this one is pretty impressive, pretty good sized, but they can easily get two times the size of the one that you're looking at right here. So they do get very large. Now cane toads have a very interesting story. Now their native habitat is actually Central and South America. That's where you naturally would find them in the wild, but they were actually introduced, so taken to other areas of the world. Now, it was for a purpose. People didn't just introduce them to areas for no reason. It was actually to deal with a beetle. So these were called cane beetles, and they actually were eating sugar cane. So people thought this large toad will probably eat lots and lots of cane beetles. It's going to be a great idea to move these toads to other areas. It'll help deal with this problem. So that is exactly what they did. In about the 1930s, People took these toads, introduced them to Florida, and then the place where they were the biggest problem was Australia. So about 3,000 toads were brought to Australia, and as you can imagine, they did a lot of bad things for Australia. First of all, they didn't really eat those cane beetles. Uh, the cane beetles tend to be high up in the sugar cane, and marine toads are kind of lazy. Uh, so they didn't really like to go high up and catch those beetles, but they were willing to eat anything else they found. These toads are very opportunistic. That means they will eat anything that they can cram into their mouths. Other insects that are down on the ground, um, other small animals, so maybe a small mouse, something like that. Um, they're also known to eat pet food. Uh, if they can find that. They've even eaten trash. Um, they also will even eat plants. Now that is very unusual for a toad. Uh, they will pretty much eat anything they can get into their mouths. So that's one reason they were a problem. They were competing with other animals that would eat a lot of insects in the area. Another reason they became such a problem, they're very good at reproducing themselves. A single female cane toad can lay 30,000 eggs. That is a lot of babies. Even if half of them do not make it to adulthood, that's still a lot of babies. Finally, the reason cane toads became such a big problem is they are very toxic. Now they actually have special toxin secreting glands and they secrete a toxin that is known as a bufotoxin. A toad of this size can produce enough toxins that they actually can kill a large dog. So any animals that would potentially want to eat an animal of this size were not able to deal with those toxins. 
Now, cane toads do have some predators in their native habitats, but when they were introduced to other areas, the predators could not deal with those toxins. So cane toads kind of just kept reproducing and are still, to this day, a huge problem in Australia. To tell you the truth, people are actually encouraged and it is legal to kill cane toads in Australia. I know that sounds kind of mean, um, but because they are still so abundant in that area, people are definitely encouraged to kill them or to destroy the eggs uh, if they do find those eggs. Um, so they are still definitely a problem. And it's just a really good example of how it's typically not a good idea to introduce a species to an area. So uh, why don't I turn this over to a couple of questions if you have any, Karen. Sounds great. Uh, one that we always expect, this one coming from nine-year-old Vivian today, name and age. I actually do not know the exact age of this toad. He came to the museum two years ago already as an adult. So I don't know his exact age. I would sort of say he's probably, uh, I don't know, five to seven years old, um, but they could leave, live easily 10 plus years in captivity. So that's my only guess that I have. Uh, I've been calling this Toad Chester, uh, which I thought is a pretty good name for him. I didn't realize that. I saw your info sheet and I said, oh, I didn't know his name was Chester. I think it's adorable. And I think you just answered five-year-old Mackenzie's question of how long do they live? So we can move on from that. And this is one of my favorites because it's an often confusing concept. What is the difference between a frog and a toad? That's a really good question. So frogs and toads are actually in the same group within the amphibians. Um, so frog is sort of the bigger group, um, kind of the umbrella term, and then toads are kind of a subset within that group. Uh, to give you a comparison, it's kind of like turtles are the larger group and then tortoises is a subset. So some general things that you can look for with toads. Now, I always like to say with animals, there are exceptions but some general toad characteristics, um, they tend to be a little bit drier. Now, I feel silly saying that because all amphibians are moist. They do have wet skin, but toads tend to tolerate being dry a little better than frogs. So frogs tend to look slimy and wet. Toads tend to be a little bit drier. Toads also tend to be bumpier. Uh, kind of have a, you might think of them as warts. A lot of times we think of toads as having warts, but they do tend to be bumpier. Um, toads also tend to do short hops rather than long leaps of frogs. Um, so those are some generalizations. Uh, like I said, there's always exceptions, um, but those are kind of generally things you can look for, uh, toads versus frogs. Excellent. Um, and a couple of more good toad questions before we move on to our final live animal today. Um, how long are their tongues? I'm guessing this individual is thinking about, you know, those cartoons you see. So does this guy have a long tongue or a short tongue? They don't have a specific long tongue. Um, I don't know if I can even give you an accurate assessment of his. They tend to just open their mouth and kind of leap for things. Um, so they don't really use their tongues like some frogs do uh, to really catch insects that might be far away. Um, like I said, these guys are kind of lazy. So they always just kind of sit on the ground and just kind of open their mouth and go after whatever comes for them. Uh, here at the museum, he mainly eats crickets that we feed to him using forceps. Um, but in the wild, they would tend to just kind of open the mouth and uh, go after whatever they can find. I just love envisioning that. Something wanders by and this toad pops out of the underbrush and munches it. Um, okay, so I think the last one we have time for about our toad, this is from a grade two classroom. So we have a whole class tuning in today. How old do the frogs have to be in order to lay their eggs? That's a good question. They reach maturity very quickly. Um, so they uh, develop from a tadpole to adult within just a couple weeks, and then they're capable of reproducing on their own within a few more months. Um, so they do get pretty big and they're capable of reproducing pretty quickly. Excellent. Well, I'm gonna share my screen again with just a couple of fun facts and maybe as Corey is swapping out, uh, I think I'm gonna... There we go. Uh, just a little bit about what Liz talked about, maybe things that we didn't get to. And while Corey is getting ready, maybe real quick, are cane toads toxic to us as humans? I'm sorry, was that a question? Yeah. 
for cage uh, rats, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Are they, us? are they toxic to us? So they have been known to make people sick. Um, if you lick them or get that bufotoxin uh, into your system, they have been known to make people sick. Uh, sorry about that. It sounded like you were saying a st uh, statement. I missed that it. it was a question. No, sorry. I was just trying to fill in the gap before Corey got mm -hmm. our next friend out, but it looks like she is ready to go. Yes. Now, our last invasive species is our largest. It is a reptile called a Central American boa constrictor. Guessing probably most of you have heard of boas before. Normally, we don't think of them in that context of being an invasive species. Now, this species of boa, as the name suggests, are found in parts of Central America, even into parts of Northern South America. Now their preferred habitat is going to be pretty hot, humid rainforests, but they are tolerant of other habitats as well. So as long as they have a warm temperature, they can survive in other areas. So they have, have actually become a problem in Southern Florida. Since it is so warm there, they have been able to survive. There's actually another large snake that's an even bigger problem than boas in Florida. And that snake is called the Burmese python. Now Burmese pythons are native to India. And if you think our boa constrictor here is impressive, I certainly do. And he's about eight feet long. Burmese pythons can get double that size. You could easily see a Burmese python 16 to 20 feet long. Now, Burmese pythons um, are a huge problem in Florida. Boas too, to a lesser extent. Now, you can probably imagine why a large snake would be a problem in an area where it's not supposed to live. First of all, these are carnivores. They are hunters. And they're also what are known as generalist predators. That means they'll pretty much eat any animal they can get. Snakes can eat things two to three times the size of their head. So you're getting a really good glimpse at our boa's head right now. Uh, there's a lot of different animals that they would be able to eat. Now that is pretty significant because this predator normally wouldn't be in that area. So they are competing with other predators in eating things that they ne also need to eat. So that's one reason why these uh, boas and pythons are a problem in Florida. Uh, another is they can be dangerous. So they can be harmful to people. You have to be really careful and cautious. Uh, if they do come across people, they can be dangerous. Uh, these snakes are also pretty elusive. Even though they are big animals, they're kind of hard to find. They tend to camouflage really well and they tend to be sit and wait predators. So they kind of wait. So they're kind of hard to find in the wild. Uh, finally, these snakes do not really have predators. These are really good sized animals. And in Florida, there aren't really too many things that can, uh, can, can prey on them when they are full size. So they are a big problem. Now, people have actually intervened in the case of the Burmese pythons and officials have started uh, capturing snakes. So they've captured about 5,000 snakes from 2017 to 2020. So uh, that's just the number they've caught and there are still lots out there. Now, the last thing I want to share about the invasive snakes in Florida, you're probably wondering how these snakes got there. Was it like the cane toads? Did people put them there? Yes, but not intentionally. Believe it or not, these snakes have gotten into Florida because they were escaped or released pets. A lot of times people do like having these snakes uh, as pets. And they are pretty good at uh, maneuvering. You probably noticed that while Corey is handling this boa right here. So if they don't have a proper enclosure, they have been known to work their way out of it. Um, so they are either escaped pets or sometimes people get too overwhelmed with having a large snake as a pet that they release it and set it free. And uh, we just like to stress that when you wanna get an animal as a pet, uh, make sure to do some homework and make sure it's a good fit for you and your family. Make sure you'll have an adequate enclosure for the animal for its whole lifetime. And make sure you're prepared for how big that animal is going to get. Uh, Cause not everything is a good pet. Even though this boa is really, really cool. This is a pretty large animal um, that you would potentially have if you did have it as a pet. So I always like to throw that out there because uh, invasive species, as we've been saying, can be a big problem in certain areas. Uh, so why don't I turn that over to some questions, Karen? 
Excellent. Um, so Manon, who is 10, wants to know how long do they live? They can be pretty long lived animals, easily 20 years in captivity. In the wild, it might be a little bit harder to survive. Even they don't, they don't have predators, they still, it's still kind of hard to find your own food and survive on your own. But if they get to adult size in the wild, they probably easily could go 10 to 15 years and then easily 20 to 25 in captivity. Vivian, who is always good with asking the question, what's his name? His name is Belize. Um, and did you, I don't know if you answered how old he is. Anthony, who's nine, would like to know. He is about 11 years old now. So he is mature. He is considered an adult. Um, but we hope that he has at least another decade uh, left since they are pretty long lived. And Vivian also asks, do they have a Jacobson's organ? And maybe just a sentence on what is a Jacobson's organ? Very good. They do have a Jacobson's organ. Um, so that is an organ on the roof of their mouth that helps them smell. So you're getting a good glimpse right now at this snake using his Jacobson's organ. I thought he wasn't gonna do it once I started talking about <laughs> it. So you noticed he flicked his tongue out. So he's collecting scent molecules when he flicks out that tongue. There it is, right on command. Um, and then he's pressing those particles, those scent particles to the roof of his mouth. And this is then telling his brain what he's smelling. So you guys are getting a very active snake right now. He's actually never been uh, up in our insect zoo. So he's uh, giving Corey uh, a pretty tough time uh, exploring in there and checking out lots of different scents. Uh, I've been watching. I feel bad for you, Corey, but you're doing a great job. <laughs> uh, okay, a couple more questions and then we are unfortunately running out of time. So Sophia asks, how big do they get? So this individual um, is probably somewhere in the range of seven and a half to eight feet long. Snakes are kind of hard to measure because you notice they often are kind of curled up. They don't like to just stretch out in an easy straight line for you to measure. Um, and this one probably weighs somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds. Um, I haven't weighed him that recently. Um, with that being said, you could see them more like 10 feet and maybe even double that weight. So just like there's a big range, like there are with people, um, you will see a range with boa constrictors. Um, but he is a pretty good size Central American boa. And then I think last one for the day, Dean, who is 10, asks, can they go into the desert? So would you find them in the desert ever? They wouldn't do as well in desert. Um, they are adaptable. I know that I said that. And they can uh, do some habitats that aren't that rainforest they really prefer. Desert would probably be a little too dry, um, so they wouldn't do as well there. Um, but maybe what's called a semi-desert, which is a little bit drier area, they might do okay there. But probably desert would be hard for them. All right. Well, thank you, Corey, for wrangling our uh, boa constrictor today. That was super awesome to get to see him on camera. And I want to thank both Liz and Corey for sharing all of their awesome information. So if you guys want to give a wave, if Corey has her hands free, Liz Bye can give guys. a wave for both of you. <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Uh, and for all of you that were tuning in, thanks so much for being with us today. I hope you enjoyed meeting some of our invasive species live at the Museum of Science. Maybe you learned a few new facts and hopefully you enjoyed it overall. If you did enjoy this program and want to know more of what we're doing, you can check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home. We're doing these types of programs daily, Monday through Friday, so you can check out that schedule. And if you enjoyed this program and are able to do so and would like to support the museum, you can check out engage.mos.org slash welcome. So with that, Again, I hope you had fun and definitely enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon.